So if you're not familiar, this is a Tandy 1000 HX. Uh, this is, well, it's not quite fair to say that it is an IBM XT, but it's pretty close to an IBM XT. If you don't know what a Tandy is, this was sort of like an IBM PC clone that went a little bit further. It's still based on an 8088, 4.77 MHz. Uh, it still has something close to CGA video. Uh, the earlier versions used five and a quarter floppies, then they switched to three and a half inch Sony micro floppies. It runs DOS, but there the similarities start to end. So you can run normal DOS applications on this and everything, but it takes its own special type of cards, from what I understand. I'm new to this as well, you'll forgive me. The floppy drive, it's a little weird. It has joystick ports on the side, the likes of which you've never seen before, these guys. And you may have noticed that there's a headphone jack over here. And in this era, that was incredibly unusual. It was not typical for computers to have sound at all, for the 46 going back. And this doesn't have a sound blaster or an ad lib or anything like that. This has a simple wave generator, the sort that the NES or the ZX Spectrum or um, not even the C64. This is in arguably inferior to the Commodore 64 in terms of its audio quality. I'd have to look it up to see what the specifics are. I think it's like three square waves or something like that. The point is, it was superior sound to what the PCs of the era were producing, which was nothing. It also has a graphic standard that's not quite CGA. It uses the CGA palette and the CGA connectors, but it's capable of more colors. And as a result of the video and the audio capabilities, it's pretty much its own console, its own game console slash software platform, just not with a huge universe of software for it. The other thing you've probably noticed is that it's an all-in-one machine. Obviously, you can't really have missed that. And that, as you probably know, is extremely rare for IBM PCs. Okay, let's be honest, it didn't happen. I can only think of one. I think the Laser 128 from VTech, I think that was an all-in-one IBM. But other than that, this is basically unheard of. So I got the only all-in-one machine, really, that I could have gotten. So I didn't want to deal with a huge steel box on my desk and a separate keyboard. And no, I just, I wanted something compact that I could stick on a shelf and then pull out when I want to run really ancient games, just like the rest of my collection. I don't have a huge house. I don't have a barn to keep all this stuff in. So this is what I got. It does work. It does boot. It's not convenient for me to show that to you right now. I'll show it to you after I fix it because yes, I do need to fix it. I already powered it up upstairs and discovered that the floppy drive won't read anything reliably. It'll get the first few bytes of the disk enough to read the folder index and not consistently. But if you try to run any files, even on a disk that I know is working, it fails. So I think that's probably a bad floppy drive. It could just be filthy. So we're gonna try cleaning the heads. We're gonna take a look at the belt. And if it turns out that one of those things fixes it, great. If not, I'll have to see whether I can swap in another floppy drive. I hate to replace this one with its distinctive bar style eject button for one of the standard Sony ones, but it looks like it's compatible. So I think I can do it. Anyway, so let's just go ahead and crack this thing open. I can't unplug the power cable. It's actually built into the chassis. So I've never taken one of these apart. I don't know anything about how to do it. We're just gonna wing it here. It looks like there's just a few screws to take out and obviously it's been opened before, but that's standard for PCs. And that looks like that's actually, that's a number, uh, what is it, number two, number three Phillips? Well, okay, the numbers wore off my drivers. It's the larger Phillips, it's not the, the standard pretty dang small one. So you can see they've marked the holes you have to take the screws out of. And it's pretty much every hole that's on the bottom except these ones which don't have screws in them. These are pretty deeply recessed holes so a magnetic screwdriver is not a bad idea. Neither one of my screwdrivers is magnetized enough to release those. We're gonna have to do it the old-fashioned way. Flip it over and hope we catch them all. Uh, now you know I wasn't really gonna do that. Come on. If you just flip it over on your hard work bench you're gonna lose all your screws. The trick is put a towel down. That way the screws lay on the towel and they don't go flying everywhere. There are going to be some people who think I'm a nut for explaining that. Oh, who wouldn't know that? But a lot of people don't. I didn't. I got a few out. No, they don't want to come out. It looks to me like I need to pull this one here as well. And this one. No. Yep. Just comes right off. Simple as that. Man, I, don't have, I do not have a lot of complaints about how this thing is built. This is a cool design. Everything sensitive is protected under this 
big metal shield. They've got, yep, not even fish paper, actual steel over the power supply. That's good. Uh, good luck if that power supply goes bad. Then they've got this chassis here that exists solely to serve the purpose of protecting the drives, of which you can have two. Looks to me like all I do is just take out these two screws and it'll be golden, but I don't think I can do that without taking the drive cage out. I think that's what these two screws are for. What the fuck? Oh, oh, okay. No, no, I'm gonna go back to what the fuck. That is a weird ass screw. That's a screw that's been forced into a, a standoff. You know, the only reason they would do that is to make it easier to take out. I think this was a machine that was made to be worked on, which is strange to think of. Now there's some rust in here. It makes you worry about the history of this machine, but we'll plot on. Okay, so, oh, there's no power connector hooked up there. Where the hell does the thing get its power then? I mean, there was never a power connector there. I'm going to have to do some reading. There might be some things about this I just don't know. The reason I'm opening this up is I think this drive's probably good. The fact it could read the first couple sectors makes me think the head isn't trashed. If that's the case, then it's probably just dirty. could also be something to do with the head. Maybe the head can't move. Maybe there's gum in the track. You know, maybe it's got some old grease in there that's keeping it from moving forward, forward and back. So rather than just replace this drive outright, you know, which might not even be practical since it looks like it may be proprietary, I'd have to Google it. But before I even do that, I'm gonna open it up and just see what I can do to rehabilitate it. So I'd rather keep the original drive anyway. Okay, the spindle moves freely, that's good. All right, now uh, we're gonna have to pop this case off in order to get deeper in there, and that's easy on these. They're just held on by spring tension. So all you do is just pop it off there and uh, right there. Fingernail or a screwdriver will do, there you go. Well, it's not clean, I'll tell you that much. I'm looking at this, I'm thinking my theory about a seized drive head. Totally realistic. If you take a look right down there on the head transport spindle, this here is the worm gear, what moves the head back and forth. That stuff in there, I don't know. Is that grease moving okay? Well, feels okay from here. You know, let's just run it with it open. See what it does. I'm just gonna go ahead and plug that in. Right there. Need an insulator to keep this from shorting out. I'm just gonna pop this slice of paper in here. Okay, now I don't have a display for this thing, but that's fine. I'm just gonna cowboy it. I remember what the layout of the interface looked like, so I'm just gonna fire this thing up blind. Okay. So it's booted by now. This has DOS and ROM. Interesting machine. Okay. So the head came down. It opened the door all right. Now I'm going to press escape for DOS. DIR. So check this out. What I've done here is I took the head and I manually advanced it. So now it's sitting here instead of back there. So when the machine starts up, it's going to want to return this head to the zero position. So it's going to want to trundle it back until it interrupts this, this opto-isolator here. Anyway, when it turns on, it's supposed to run the head back, okay? Watch what happens. See that? It's trying to run, but it can't run. So what's going on here is that this grease on here is old and nasty. And this drive motor doesn't have enough force to, to drag through it. So that grease has got to go, and I've got just the thing for it. I'm gonna use this stuff called CLP. It's for uh, cleaning guns, but I think you should do here all right. We're gonna swab as much off as we can. Oh yeah, that stuff's real real gross. Ew. Gotta use the precision driver to get that nasty wad back there out. Boy, that looks disgusting. 
Okay, let's turn it back on, see if it'll run the drive motor now. Well, that's better. Okay, I'm going to do another one. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this Q-tip on here. I'm just going to let it ride along while it starts up, and that should scrub out the grooves. There we go. While I'm in here, I do have some pretty pure alcohol, so I'm going to go ahead and just dry brush the heads a little bit. All right, there we go. Now, I don't think there's much else we even conceptually can clean with this thing, so let's go ahead, get it over on the other bench, and fire it up and see if it goes. Now I apologize for how shitty this looks, it's just the composite on this machine is not great looking to begin with, and it's running through several extension cords right now and going through a capture box. But let's see if the disc reads. Okay, now we we'll do this before, and I can go into the directory, and let's see if the game will run. Yes, it will. This is Quadralian, which I had running on my VGA machine the other day. Kind of a neat game, but it ran way too fast. Let's see how it runs here. How do you like that? It wasn't dead after all. You know, I really can't say this enough times. Nothing's dead until it's dead. I don't know. To a certain extent, I guess there is a bit of a feel to it. I mean, you do have to, to have a, a sense of what represents an irrecoverable failure. You know, some things are harmless. Some things are encouraging. If something just doesn't work, then that doesn't necessarily mean it's completely trashed versus if something you know puts out smoke or makes a horrible grinding noise or something but even then you know a horrible grinding noise uh, that can represent a really easy to fix problem like just a foreign object that's stuck in a gear you know you just don't know until you know the uh the term autopsy comes from greek latin i don't know anything but it means to see for yourself so we do an autopsy to figure out why someone died, and the reason it's an autopsy is because rather than going off of assumptions, you're gonna go see for yourself why they died. And that's what you always have to do. You have to see for yourself, because, hey, you know, what was I gonna do, break it worse? If I was gonna have to replace it anyway, who cares if I mess something up? See, there's no reason not to get in and take a look for yourself. There's just no reason at all. Always do it, every time. Doesn't matter if you, doesn't matter if you don't know what you'd do if you did find a problem, do it anyway. You never know what you're capable of until you know what it is you're being asked to do. You know, I've heard people say, I don't know how to do that. I've heard people say, I don't know how to fix that computer. I'm like, well, I mean, shit, neither did I. I opened it up and I looked for problems. Same goes for a lot of stuff. You know, you, you open it up, you look to see what's, what's wrong. I want to point out, by the way, this keyboard honestly looks pretty durable, but I love how these are the connectors for the keyboard lights and they're just kind of just kind of poked on there just hanging out they don't actually have any connectors they go into I'm not sure if that was stock but whatever I think you probably use some cleaning but honestly with the floppy drive fixed I just want to use it for now so I'm just gonna put it back together now I don't currently have a joystick for this and that's a shame I gotta go look on eBay see if I can find one but I have a feeling I'll pay a fortune for it if anybody has one they want to get rid of let me know it's gonna be a while before I have the ability to capture video off this thing very well because it uses CGA and CGA is actually very very hard to convert to anything I mean you saw the video output on composite 
So I could use that, but do you really want me to? I want to go track down a bunch of old Tandy specific titles and try them out. And I have found some websites for doing that. And of course I'm going to go look on eBay and that sort of thing. And once I can get some, I'll be sure to try and get them on the channel. Maybe I'll even do a game stream. I have a Twitch channel. If you don't know about that, you can check the description below and I'll put a link there to it. Um, I've been streaming pretty frequently. I usually do like old Windows games, old DOS games. So yeah, if you want to watch me do this stuff live, there's a lot of stuff I don't consider channel worthy. You know, I'm not going to put up a video of Monster Truck Madness 2. You can find those already. That's nothing special. You don't need me for that. So that's that. You can take it upstairs and play with it now. Um, keep your eye out. I'll hopefully be getting some videos up on this as soon as I've got the adapter I ordered for it. I should convert it over to a format I can actually capture. We'll see how well that plays out once I get it. But anyway, thanks for joining me, and you have a great one.